Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Scott McKay, for that gracious introduction and your hospitality for the beer 22 years ago. Uh, my wife, Deb, who is someplace here, Deb, would you uh, identify yourself anyhow? She will, I know that she was laughing uh, somewhat sardonically at the story because any episode of me meeting anybody in any part of the world ends with going out for a beer that evening. So I, I'm glad to have done it in Providence um, long ago. Scott Wolf, thank you so much for the, the introduction. Thanks to everybody here in GrowSmart and uh, in, in the, the Power of, of Place Summit. Deb and I have been, we come to Providence as somewhat familiar figures. We've been here many times over the years, but we're mainly here to learn and find out about what, what is going on, to see things like your wonderful video to give us an idea of the spirit of Rhode Island and the spirit of Providence. But we're also here because without realizing it, we figured out yesterday that over the past four or five years, we had been preparing for this Power of Place Summit that everything we've been seeing across the country over the last uh, few years brought us to the kinds of discussions you're having here, the kinds of prospects you're laying out for your cities and your state, and the ways in which you hope you can chart a better future. So what I would like to do in the next uh, while, again, as the person who is from out of town, I'm not gonna presume to tell you much in detail about the choices you face in Rhode Island itself, but I think I can tell you about the national panorama into which your efforts fit, and fit very appropriately. I mean, there's ways in which you're on the same arc that people in other parts of the country have been following over the last generation. You've succeeded out many things. You've succeeded in many things that other people would like to learn from. There are some places where examples from other parts of the country would apply here. So that is what I would like to do in the few minutes ahead. And the way I'm going to plan to do this is first. I'm going to tell you how I know, how Deb and I know the things we're going to purport to say to you of what it was, what was the process of trying to learn about places like Rhode Island, like Providence around the country, and the challenges they're having. Second, I'll sketch out some of the big trends that surprised us. Um, something that uh, Scott McKay and I were talking about last night at a reception is the process of reporting at its best is finding out the things you didn't know until you showed up. And by showing up in a lot of the, of the country over the last uh, couple of years, we've seen things we hadn't anticipated and I think are useful framing ideas for the decisions you have to make about Rhode Island. Third, I'm gonna talk about some specific lessons or at least indicators of success that we've seen around the country. And then finally, I'm going to try to connect the work you're doing here locally and statewide with the larger situation the nation is in at the moment, of how this stage in American history, of its political coherence, its economic development, the choices it, ha it has, the way in which your efforts here fit in. So that is the plan over the next 30 minutes. Uh, then I'll have a few minutes for questions, and then I'll be happy to stay through the rest of the day and hear the, the decisions uh, you're making and the discussions you're having. So first, let me tell you a little bit about the background of the project that led to this book, which, just in case you didn't hear it the first time, is called Our Towns, A 100,000-Mile Journey into the Heart of America. It's out in, in, in May. Over the entirety of my career with the Atlantic, which is now very long, I started working there after I left working in the Jimmy Carter administration back in the 1970s, I realized that the background question I've always tried to trying to deal with has been, is America really in trouble? Or what kind of trouble really is America in? In the 1970s and early 80s, as some of you here will recall, there were all sorts of waves of industrial dislocation, and Deb and I spent time in Texas then, talking to people who were either losing their jobs in the oil industry or dealing with a big influx of refugees from Vietnam and figuring out how they fit into the panorama then. And in various ways that I will just not go into detail, we lived in Japan, we traveled in Southeast Asia, and we spent about four years living in China recently trying to say, how does the American model of inclusion, of opportunity, of regionalism, of federalism, of the messy work of democracy, how does that suit the kind of challenges that are going on around the world. And we've written lots of books and done lots of radio broadcasts and articles about this ongoing saga of how America stands. When we came back from our latest stint in China, we were there through mid-2011 writing, writing books. And here I'll say, 
the book that Deb wrote, which is called Dreaming in Chinese, was endorsed both by the New Yorker magazine and by Oprah. And you don't do better than that. So this is, uh, any of you have any interest in language or Chinese or Oprah, I direct you to, to, to Deb, Deb's book. But when we were living in China, of course, the world narrative and the Chinese narrative was that America had gone into another uh, set of really deep problems. The United States had ticked off the world financial collapse of 2008, 2009. The reports from the U.S. were about all the people left behind, all the carnage being done around the country. And the sense in China was that China had put people to work right away. The U.S. was having trouble. And so we thought, let's find a way to try to look at the condition of the U.S. the same way we had done it in China and Malaysia and Japan, which is essentially hitting the road. When we lived in China, we'd always get on a bus or a train or whatever conveyance there was, there was one time, uh, horses and yaks. Uh, and try to see what is it like in the villages that are far away from Shanghai and Beijing. And so starting in, I guess, around the time, there was a particular moment in the 2012 presidential campaign when Romney, as you may recall, was running against uh, Obama. We were in our little airplane following the Romney campaign on a bus capade through central Pennsylvania. And we thought, these places are interesting. We were in Hazleton. We were in Scranton. We were in these places. We thought, these cities have or have dramas that are, need to be uh, described more. And so, to, to uh, a few months later, we put an article on the Atlantic's website saying, we're looking for cities whose story is some kind of microcosm of the American story. Smaller places that are not usually in the news, unless there's a tornado, unless there's a shooting, unless there's some, some kind of opioid project. But they're not really in the news the way that Seattle is, the way that, that Boston is, or New York. We're looking for cities that have had some kind of problem, economic, mill closing, demographic, you name it. And we're looking for cities where the response is interesting or indicative. And within a week after my putting that item on the Atlantic site, we got about 1,000 essays back. People saying, my town, Gadsden, Alabama, is America's town. My town, Chico, California, is America's town. My town, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, et cetera, Reno, Nevada. Uh, there was one state for which we got no nominations. Uh, it was not Rhode Island, uh, but I'll, I'll let you, uh, that can come up later in the questioning. But we got a, a huge tapestry of American cities. And over the next couple of years, partly by science, partly by accident, partly just by incremental seeing what we'd learned and where we wanted to go, we ended up going, going to about 50 places and spending serious time in about 25 cities. And by serious, I mean usually a total of about two weeks and going there usually once and then again for a return visit. Places as northeast as Eastport, Maine. Anybody been to Eastport, Maine? That is part of the northeast. As southwest as Ajo, Arizona. Anybody ever been there? It's a place where it used to have the country's biggest copper mine that closed down cold and now it's trying to reinvent itself. Places up in the upper northwest and central Oregon and, and Montana. Places in the deep south, a lot of time in Mississippi and South Carolina and Georgia. Uh, in in um, Allentown, PA and Erie, PA, a long sort of saga. And as things went on, we were doing reports for The Atlantic, a couple of articles, and realizing we felt we had seen something about the country that was generally difficult to perceive in most national news or from, from, um, from local papers too, because there was a kind of cognitive dissonance. I'll get to that in a moment, but mainly a contrast between what people observed in their own towns, which to cut to the chase, in most cases involved some kind of forward movement of the sort you're describing, you're, you're undertaking in Providence over the last generation and trying to spread to the state. Some conflict between that and what they assumed was happening every place else. You know, the idea that whatever we're making succeed here in Providence is great, but the rest of the country must be some kind of huge mess because that is essentially the tension between what's locally knowable and what we get from the news. And so the picture we tried to present um, in these stories in the book we have uh, coming up is that there is a different kind of United States taking place right now, taking place in this room, and in rooms like this around the country where we've been in dozens of states over the last couple of years. And that if people knew that, 
it would them, give them a different sense of purpose about what they're doing state by state and city by city and about what the prospect is for, for the United States. So, so that is the project as a whole, that we've spent a long time looking open-endedly at cities. I'll say one other thing about the project, which I think is really important, and Scott and other reporters in the room, I think, will understand the crucial nature of this. 99% of the time, when a national news organization goes to some place off the coast, goes to any place in Iowa, or the Dakotas, or Central California, or whatever, the premise is always, uh, and if you're not going there for a disaster of some kind, the point is you're always fitting those people into some pre-existing matrix of ideas or narrative. Either you're asking them off the start, do you like Trump, do you hate Trump? Do you like Hillary, do you hate Hillary? Do you like Obama, do you hate Obama? Et cetera, et cetera. They're fitting it into the flattening two-dimensional grid of national politics. Or you have cooked up a pre-existing story, tell me how globalization has wrecked your life. You know, tell me how opioids have, have overwhelmed your health system. Those things may be true, but the approach we took was never to ask about national politics, never to, to go to a town with a pre-existing uh, grid, although we had ideas, but instead to start out saying, what's happening in this town? What's getting better? What's getting worse? What do people care about? Who makes the town go? Um, are, are young people moving in or moving away? What kind of young people are moving in? And all, all those sorts of things. Take, having the idea of taking seriously the life of a place like Fresno, California, or San Bernardino, which is uh, right, right near where I grew up, as opposed to using them as specimens of what might be a national narrative. So, so that was the approach. What sorts of things did we find? I'll, I'll take off just a couple of the trends that were surprising to us in the things you didn't know until you showed up category, because these are things we would not have expected five years ago, and now we believe, and we'll grab any of you by the lapels uh, as appropriate uh, after, afterwards to try to convince you of, because we've seen them in so many places, and hints of them even in this video and in some of the tours we've had of, of, uh, of Providence in the last uh, day. One of them that I think is most surprising, but I bet you've seen evidence of here in Rhode Island and Providence, is what I think of as the reverse talent sort, or reverse migration, by which I mean this. We all know that through history, and especially in the last generation, let's say, there's been a concentration of ambitious people in certain centers. Finance people go to New York. Government people go to D.C. Tech people go to Seattle or San Francisco, and on through a list, and through the sort of next tier of, of major cities after those big coastal ones. That's always been true, and it will continue to be true. But we've also seen in places a step or two down from there in size and scale and crucially cost, people who either have already done or could very easily do first tier competitive major metropolis work who have decided that the overall life balance for them, for their families, for their companies, for their place in society is better in Fresno, in Providence, in Duluth, in Sioux Falls, in, uh, in, in Columbus, um, both Columbus, Ohio and Columbus, Mississippi. And I can give you countless details of this. Partly it involves the arbitrage in real estate. You know, there are about a dozen cities in the United States where really expensive real estate is the factor that destroys your life. And in the rest of the country, real estate is pretty cheap. And to have that sense of what you can do with a much lower burn rate of real estate costs in some place that's not New York or even Brooklyn or LA or all the rest, that has been a very important thing. It also is usually there is some connection that makes people think, uh, I went to college, uh, Duluth, Minnesota. Anybody been to Duluth? It's a city we love. That has a really sort of vibrant tech startup scene now, very different from 20 years ago, driven partly by people who went to college there, usually University of Minnesota, Duluth, and thought, I like this. I want to find a way to start my business here. I'm sure that's happened in Rhode Island. I'm sure it's part of the saga here. If people decide rather than, uh, than, than be living in, in Manhattan, there's a d different balance here. And so, 
the idea of the United States as opposed to being five big centers sucking the talent out of the rest of the country and the rest of the world, we maybe have a hundred centers, a hundred regional centers that are creative and are having ways to have technology appropriate to their regions, appropriate to their, their identities. I'll give you just one, one more illustration, both in Sioux Falls and in Fresno, each of which, as you know, and also Bend, Oregon, they're all part of big agricultural uh, heartlands. And there they have people who, instead of being developers in Seattle or San Francisco in the tech industry, and some of them have done that in the past, they decide there's a possibility for agricultural, agricultural tech-related industries like we can do here on the prairies or we can do here in, in uh, the orchards of Central California. So just the idea of, of this reverse migration, I think, is an important one, which gives purpose to what's happening in a lot of other places. A related codicil to this that I bet has relevance in Rhode Island, too, is involves the power of self-image civic self-image, regional self-image, even statewide self-image, as either a hindering or an empowering and motivating force. Here is what I mean. Probably people in San Francisco and New York feel as if they get to look down on everybody else, and there's nobody who's looking down on them. But most of the rest of the country feel somehow that they, there's something wrong with their self-image, and somebody's looking down on them. Let's start with Mississippi, aware of everybody looking down on them. And the Midwest in general feels as if the media establishment is looking down on them. The interior of California is very acutely aware of the coastal zones looking down on them. Um, and you can, you know, the, the, the so-called Rust Belt cities know the very name Rust Belt. You can go on for a long time. We spent many visits in Erie, Pennsylvania where people are bitterly, uh, are both bitterly proud of the nickname Dreary Erie, or the mistake on, on, on the lake. And I, I've had enough discussions here to know that this can be a factor in Rhode Island's self-image too. What struck us is how many places, or I think Reno, Nevada, is trying to avoid the image of just being a gambling town, or a gaming town, as they say, and wanting to be a, a, a tech center. But in so many places, the idea, in some places, this can be a, a disabling factor, and I think in some of Appalachia that is true. But in a lot of other places, this has a we'll show you turnaround effect, where uh, in, in a recent convention, very much like this one in Fresno, the banner above the, uh, the, the conference ground said, unapologetically Fresno. And that's sort of the idea of, okay, we're gonna show you. Uh, there's a story in our book which involves profanity, so I won't give it here in this August setting, about how the people in Mississippi, when they started making helicopters for Airbus in Mississippi, essentially said, we can stand up a little straighter now. In Mississippi, we're making this stuff. We're making high-tech helicopters. And so I think that, that if that is a factor in Rhode Island's um, growth strategy or identity of feeling somehow looked down on in a lot there's a lot of that going on, going around in the country, and a lot of places it's been turned to effect by embracing it, saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to show you. Um, we've seen, and I'll just give a, a few other illustrations of some of the big trends we didn't know uh, before we, we got here. The spirit of that video, which I thought was really remarkable, matched in all but one aspect <laughs> what we've seen in many other places. The, uh, the aspect that is new and perhaps is a feature of the last year or so in our national politics was the take, take, take aspect. That was an interesting way to talk about the benefits to the self of being in Rhode Island. But the idea that here we have more going on than you knew, that is something that, that you see in Dodge City, Kansas. You see it just uh, in, in, in lots of places. And the idea that, that every place in the country where we went, people are aware of the problems they have. Uh, we could have an enumeration list now for the problems that Rhode Island has, whether they are uh, inequality of growth or homelessness or, or uneven development. You know the list better than I do, but I know some of the list too. And every city in the country has such a list. The difference from the general perception is being aware of that list, they feel as if the movement is in the positive direction rather than the negative direction. 
almost every place we went, the idea was, yeah, here in North e northeastern Mississippi, we got a lot of problems, and they're obvious. But if you look compared to 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you know, we are really are dealing with our schools are different, our environmental pro uh, programs have something going for them. A symbol in uh, this part of Mississippi we spent time in is the industrial succession. The people who are now working at the helicopter factory and also at the most advanced steel mill in North America, uh, 10 years ago, they or their cousins might have been working at a factory that made toilet seat covers, uh, which then uh, closed for, with competition from Central America. And also they made um, headstones for the military. Um, so that, but that was the previous industry. Now they have these more advanced ones. But around the country, there's a sense of we have problems, but there is movement in the right direction rather than the direction, direction we don't want. We're seeing, I haven't asked people in Rhode Island about this, but we saw something at sharp odds from the tone of national politics, place after place after place, which was the position of immigrants and refugees in the established tapestry of society, especially in what you could think of as declining communities in, in the upper uh, Northeast or the, the upper Midwest. And here's what I mean. In the long saga of America's immigration history, as I best understand it from academic studies and journalistic studies, immigration has always been disruptive to the people who are already here. It was disruptive when the Italians and Portuguese arrived and when the Germans and the Irish and the Poles and the Vietnamese more recently and any group of people when they've arrived, it's been disruptive just because ethnic change is. What makes the United States unusual is that on the whole, it has absorbed the, the disruption. It has recognized both the idealistic and the practical benefits of having an outsized share of the world's ambition come within our shores and all the cultural diversity it brings. In most of the country, that is still the city by city reality. I'll give just, just, just one illustration. Western Kansas is now a largely Latino part of the country. Uh, you, you think of Dodge City, for example. Has anybody here seen Gunsmoke, you know, the TV series? It's set in Dodge City. Gunsmoke is still run in Germany. So most of the tourists in Dodge City are Germans coming to see the Long Branch uh, Saloon and all of, all of that. But the population of Dodge City is now majority Latino because of the beef packing industry. And the school districts there is very heavily Latino. So you have an interesting pyramid, the electorate, the voting uh, population and civic leadership, mainly Anglo, population slightly Latino, school district is mainly Latino, and yet the, the mainly white voters of Dodge City keep passing bond issues to fund their schools, thinking that these new children who look different from us are the future of the city, and it's in our interest to do that. This is in a very red state, a city that voted very heavily for Donald Trump in the last election. But in local terms, there is nothing like the uh, sort of desire to rid themselves of the outsider. Indeed, the closer you get to the Mexican border, the less likely you are to hear a build the wall chant any place. It's something that you hear mainly in New Hampshire or uh, places of that sort. So the, the, the saga of immigration and refugees going on, there's institutional innovation. There are all sorts of other things related to what you're doing that we, we've seen. And I will refer you to our, our book for more about that. Let me, um, just, just, so I'll say that, that in countless ways, we saw things by being there, similar to what we saw just in a few hours in Providence, but you can find their counterparts around the country making you think that people around the country and their communities are acting as agents and shapers of their future, not just as passive objects of the large forces of history. Those large forces matter. We went to a Dust Bowl part of Oklahoma, and the people there just had to leave during the Dust Bowl because you couldn't survive. But most places, most communities, people act as if they have some agency over their future. From, so that is the very long second main point. I'm gonna do a much quicker third point and then get to the big payoff of national politics. So the third thing I'll talk about is we came up with a sort of checklist of traits that distinguish communities that we started to recognize after we've seen a couple dozen uh, towns of places where this is a sign of a city on the rise. I'll just list them off a sentence or so for each. I had 10 and a half of these markers 
you can see if they apply here. I'll just go through the list quickly. Point number one, the poison of national politics was somehow separated from local life. That if you ask people about national politics, they'd get very angry. If you didn't ask them about that, they'd find ways to, do, to make deals together. I had a little set piece in the Atlantic comparing Greenville, South Carolina, very conservative, Burlington, Vermont, very, very uh, progressive. If you didn't know they were different cities, you would think they were the same city. They run the same way, the university, business relationships, strong mayors, and all of that. Uh, second indication of a city on the rise. The way I describe this is you could pick out the local patriots. If you ask somebody who makes this town go, there would be answers to that question. It could be different people, a librarian, a university professor, a philanthropist, a leading family, a mayor, a congressperson, whatever, but that there was an identifiable, ca an identifiable cast of characters was important. A third trait of a city that is working. If you ask people what public-private partnerships mean, they can point to something specific. They can say, we moved this river. We did, they wouldn't say we moved this river any place but here, but they, they can, <laughs> can say, say it here. Uh, they'll say this bridge, this school, uh, this uh, high-tech startup area. It's not just a phrase, it's a specific tangible thing, and you can find that as a very clear marker of cities that are working and cities are not. A fourth marker that struck us is that people knew the civic story. That is the sense of where their city had been and where it was going, and how both the successes and the problems of right now fit into this long narrative arc. And it, it, it avoids that sense, you know, there's an American national story, families have their stories, individuals have their stories. If people shared a sense of the civic story, it gave them patience and the willingness to invest in a sense of where they all, all were, were going. Um, a fifth indicator is they have a downtown that is coming back. I have a whole theory of that, which I'll spare you from now, but I was very interested in seeing what you're doing here in Providence. I know there's a lot of still bones of uh, good downtowns uh, throughout uh, Rhode Island. Um, the next one is an unfair criterion for many cities, but it certainly applies here, which is they are able to take advantage of a research university nearby with all the spin-offs and benefits that come, the students it attracts, the faculty attracts. The next one on the list, even if you don't have a research university, taking seriously a community college is a fundamentally important part of this stage in America's evolution. I'd never really paid that much attention to community colleges before, um, even though my home state of California has a very extensive network of them. But I now think that they are, for this era, the most important educational institutions. Because they're the ones that can connect people who are being dislocated by today's technological shifts and globalizing shifts to the new opportunities that do exist in skilled trade jobs and being adaptable for future jobs. And so innovative community colleges are very important. Next marker, number eight, if you're following along, is unusual schools. We, every place we went, we asked, what's an unusual school here? And there were a lot of them, including surprisingly, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Georgia had some of the most impressive, unusual public schools that we, we saw. Um, ninth on the list, a trait we, that, that sort of snuck up on us and we thought put more and more attention to, which is that cities that are making it find ways to make themselves open. By open, I mean attracting new people, making them feel welcome, making young people feel welcome, making outsiders feel welcome, of not having this elbows out, well, we didn't do it that way, you kids get off my lawn attitude, but instead, you kids, come on. You maybe not want a lawn, you're gonna live in a different way, but this is, you are our future, you are our, our, our children, and even if you're not technically our children, you're civically our children, and that's a very strong um, case. Tenth on the list, is that cities with, that seem to us to be working, one way or another, are not afraid of making big plans, saying 20 years from now, this is the way the river's gonna look. 20 years from now, this is how this downtown will be. 50 years from now, this is what we're doing with green space. I mention this because in national politics, that's practically impossible now. You get laughed at if you sort of have any plan beyond next week or the, the continuing resolution. But in cities, people are able to carry out many of these plans, and so that, that is a, a sign. Now the 
one minute sum up of how this fits the national mood. Um, I know that my wife Deb was also chortling um, lovingly but bitterly when Scott McKay mentioned that 22 years ago I was talking about the dawn of the second Gilded Age. Because this is essentially the only idea I ever have. <laughs> that, that this is that America is going through all the contortions in the beginning of the 21st century that it did from 1880 through 1920 or so. The, the dislocation by, uh, by, by surprising new technology, the rise of new fortunes, the elimination of previous jobs, the ethnic change, the corrupt politics, all the things that happened essentially uh, after the Civil War towards World War I, we're going through now. And the, there's no exact parallels of one, you know, things never happen in just the same way. And I think the, the George Santayana quote about those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it, that's done more damage than good, probably, of people uh, just, just rolling out because things are always different. But I think it is worth studying the ways in which that era of corruption, extremes, and dislocation led to a progressive and reform era in the early 20th century in one particular way that bears on your work, which is that when conditions were such, through the two Roosevelts and through the dislo dislocation of World War I and then the Depression, for new reform ideas to be applied to problems that had grown up over the previous half century, the reason there were ideas available is that civic and state reformers across the country had been experimenting with them and trying them out and planning across the Midwest, in California, in Texas, and other places. I think something like that is going on now. And the way to think that what you're doing is important for Rhode Island, but also important for the country, is to recognize there is this movement in every state we've been there are gatherings like this and groups like this and success stories like this and videos like that with less edge that are showing about what is possible in Kansas and in Montana and in, in Oregon and other places. So if you think that what you're doing matters for the state in its future, but also you're planting the seed corn or uh, trying out the new ideas, serving as the test bed for ideas that at the appropriate point can have some relevance and application in national politics, then it gives your efforts here all the more, it should give you all the more enthusiasm for what you're doing. Yes, there are big problems in Rhode Island. Yes, there are things you're not going to work out. Yes, there are areas where there will be backsliding. But overall, the momentum that you all are creating, I think, is, is impressive to an outsider and should be seen in a way that I hope makes you feel better as part of a diaspora of reform across the country of people trying to do what you're doing here from uh, states of every size and at every point along the economic ladder. So I wish you well in the efforts that you're undertaking here. And we'll be back here to learn more about them. And for now, thank you. And I'll be happy to answer a question or two and then turn the stage over. And Scott, I welcome you.